I want to follow up today on a message that I gave two weeks ago. A message about righteousness. In our Sabbath school lesson this morning, and I enjoyed that, holiness, righteousness and holiness, they're two related words. The beauty of holiness, the beauty of righteousness, righteousness. A message about righteousness, right doing, Christ's personal righteousness and his righteous life and his obedient death. I say obedient because uh, in Philippians 2, verse 8, it says that he was obedient even unto death, the death of the cross. He promised in the covenant to forgive our sins and, and to uh, be with every repentant sinner in forgiveness. Every repentant sinner. He promised to do that. And in Hebrews eight twelve, he says our sins, sins and iniquities he will remember no more. And to fulfill that task, it took him on a long and dangerous journey, a 30-year, 33-year pilgrimage to this earth, a life of rejection, a life of absolute perfection, a life of suffering. 1 Peter 2.22 says he did no sin. And ending with the blood sacrifice of a perfect life. Not, nothing short of this is the righteousness of Christ. His righteous life and his obedient death. Romans 1, 16 and 17 talks about the gospel being a revelation of the very righteousness of God. That's where we see the gospel. That's where we see the righteousness of God most fully displayed in the gospel and the cross. The very righteousness of God. That's really what the gospel is. The righteousness of God. And when Paul uses such an expression, he's talking about the righteousness of one person. The man Christ Jesus. God's acceptance of us is on the basis of a perfect righteousness. I would like to invite you to turn with me this morning to Psalm 3724. Psalm 3724. I'm sorry, it's 3524, 3524. <clears throat> he says here, the psalmist, judge me, O Lord, according to what? What does it say? Thy righteousness, okay? He's not asking for him to be judged on the basis of his degree of sanctification or behavior, right? He wants to be judged on the, you know, he understood righteousness by faith. And he says, judge me, O Lord, my God, according to thy righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. That is his enemies. He had a lot of enemies. <clears throat> In Paul, the righteousness of faith is imputed righteousness to every believer as a free gift called grace. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10 was our scripture reading this morning. I'd like to have us read... Uh, a portion of that scripture reading, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. You all have it? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. It's an interesting thing here that we, he says that we are, not, we are not accepted on the basis of our works. And yet, in verse 10, he says that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, what? Unto good works. We're saved from something to something. And that to something is good works. This is not presumption. Believe it. This is what the Bible says. Believe it. All Take all the comfort you can from it. Presumptions, presumption uh, and presumptuous assurance is not faith. But we're not talking about presumption here. We're talking about, about uh, something that's real and concrete. 
by grace are ye saved. When imputed to the true believer in Jesus, the result is that God looks upon that believer as though he had never ever sinned. Isn't that good news? That's liberating news. No debt owed the law in this transaction. Romans chapter 6, verse 14. These are things that uh, have been handed down to us from the prophets. Romans chapter 6, verse 14. I used to look at a text like this. You know, we, in, our, in our personal journey, we go along sometimes from, from Sinai to Calvary, right? We start with the law sometimes, don't we? I think everybody that I've, that I've known uh, really is attracted because of the law to our message, okay? But notice what this text says, verse 14. Romans 6, verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under what? Grace. Under grace. Um, if we take a look at uh, uh, Romans 8, verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Precious truths that we, that we need to look at. I want to invite you to turn to Romans chapter 4 now. Romans chapter 4. This is a, a, a jewel right in the heart of those first eight chapters where Paul is discussing the subject of how we're accepted by God on the basis of faith. Chapter 4, let's read verses 1 to 6. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was, what is the next word? Counted, counted, counted to him unto, for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. If you really want to get in debt, just try to have salvation by trying harder and working harder. And the more in debt you'll be because you'll take your eyes off of Jesus and become more conscious of what you're doing. We don't want to do that. That's how we get into debt. Verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is what again? Counted for righteousness, even as David also described it, the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Now verses 22 to 25. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. It's the same, same idea, imputed, uh, reckoned, uh, counted righteous by you know, God doesn't have rose-colored glasses on when he says this. He's looking at reality. Jesus is our substitute and surety. He paid all the bills. And we look to him for this wonderful gift called justification. Verse 22 again. For, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for what? Us also, to whom it was imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Then the very next chapter. I'd like to read the first uh, uh, few verses from chapter 5. It says, therefore, after what we've just been reading, therefore, when we see a therefore, what should we do? Ask yourself, what is it there for, <laughs> okay? Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith unto his grace. By what? Grace. By faith. Into his grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and in patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So, <clears throat> justification means to be declared righteous, reckoned righteous. It does not mean to be made righteous. There's an important distinction here that we need to understand. When we truly believe such an unbelievable, popular, unpopular thing, and I say unpopular, because it was very unpopular when Paul preached this all around the Mediterranean Rim. In fact, 
He was accused of doing away with the law. And he was martyred because of it. He was very unpopular. It was an unpopular thing, and to most people on earth, it's an unbelievable thing. It is so good that you cannot really hardly believe it. You think Paul was saying this uh, in a way that uh, was unbelievable? He really believed it. Um, he was accused of being doing away with the law. That's why he wrote verse 31 of chapter 3. It says, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. We don't, yea, we establish the law. I believe that the only one who is justified by faith and understands this principle of the gift and grace are the only ones who really are equipped to keep the law. Because more than anything else, we will want to be what he says we already are in him. What a, what a motivation that he holds out to us. When we accept and believe, the Holy Spirit comes and plants love, the love, plants love for God in our hearts so that we can run the way of God's commandments. We read verse 5 of chapter 5 here just a little bit ago. Let's look at it again. Romans 5, 5. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. So we're accepted on the basis of faith in the righteousness of another, an outside of me righteousness, right? But then the Holy, when we do that, when we give our hearts to Jesus in a meaningful way like that, what does he do? He pours love into our hearts so that we can run the way of God's commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. New birth here, a new creation. Let's read a couple of texts. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If any man be in Christ, he is a what? A new creature, or some translations say a new creation. And we just read Romans 5, 5. Now I'd like to take us to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. And uh, let's read verse, verses... Uh, 8 to 10, Romans chapter 13, 8 to 10. This is one of the best definitions of love in the whole Bible that I've been able to find. Revelation 13, 8 to 10. Owe no man anything, but to love one another, there's that word again, that the Holy Spirit plants in our hearts. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. What law is he talking about here? Very plain in the New Testament. He's talking about the Decalogue, right? The Ten Commandments that were written on tables of stone. Really, he wants to write them on our hearts now, doesn't he? For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the what? Say it. Fulfilling of the law. If I really love Ray here this morning, I won't lie to him, right? Love is the fulfilling of the law. All of these commandments are that way. If I love God supremely, I'll have no other gods before him. I won't make any graven images. I will not take his name in vain. If I love him supremely, I'll keep Sabbath holy. That's how we love God. And then follow all those other six commandments about how we love our fellow men, right? Uh, we don't lie to them. We don't steal from them. But don't put your trust in your performance. I want to say that again. Your performance in another way. Your performance is not meritorious. The only merit we have for acceptance is the life and the suffering of one person. That's not well understood. The newborn believer is inspired and taught and empowered by the Holy Spirit, but we still have the flesh, the fleshly nature, the sinful nature, and we are subject to failure. But if we sin, we have an advocate with who? The Father. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. 
This life of sanctification is a process, a growth process. It never complete in this life. I would like to um, uh, suggest for your reading Acts of the Apostles 5, 16, and 61 on this subject. Acts of the Apostles 5, 16, and 61. I see some of you are taking notes. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. But all the while we are growing up into Christ, in my organism, the rainbow of justification hovers over us. And God looks at us and accepts us on the basis of the righteousness of his own son. It's like a rainbow over us. The Bible also called, speaks of it as the robe of his righteousness, right? Whose righteousness? His righteousness. What is his righteousness like? It's perfect, connected, it's, it's, and it connects with us. Christ's righteousness is imputed, credited to us as though we had never sinned, and that's the good news. As though we had lived like Jesus lived. One of the reformers, I think John Bunyan wrote this, he looks at us as though we had lived like Jesus lived, as spoke like he spoke, and behaved like he behaved. That's how he looks at us. This is called imputed righteousness, our merit for acceptance with him. It stems from our faith in the imputed gift, even the righteousness of Christ. On the other hand, Paul uses another expression to describe our own sanctification. He calls it the righteousness of the law. In a number of places in his writings, in the writings of Paul, he uses the expression, the righteousness of the law. And uh, that is a description of, of our sanctification, our keeping of the law. But when he's talking about the righteousness of faith, the righteousness of Christ, he's talking about only one righteousness in all the universe. And that resides in the heart, in the experience, in the life of our Savior. What an idea. Our personal law keeping always falls short of God's ideal. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I believe that's written in the original in the present continuous tense. For all have sinned and continue to come short of the glory of God every day. James 3 verse 2 says that in many things we all offend. That's also in the present continuous. For in many things we all offend every day. Okay. Sometimes some of you have heard me say this before, but I have to ask myself, who do I, did I offend this morning? Where did I fall short this morning? And we need to constantly examine our lives, but, but we realize that our life, imperfect though it is, is not the basis of our salvation. So if we're not accepted by God on the basis of our personal performance, then is our sanctified growth important? Is, what's, what's the importance of it then? If, we, if it's all in the merit of Christ's righteousness, what is the value of sanctification? Is our performance important? And yes, I have to say you, yes, indeed. And the Germans would say, jawohl. I don't know what it is in the Spanish. Yes, indeed. It's very important in every way. Sanctification is our fitness for heaven. You know, one day when Jesus comes, the redeemed are going to live in the, in the company, in the fellowship of the angels, which never fell. So this day-by-day -day walk with Jesus is extremely important. It's our fitness for heaven in the spirit of prophecy. Whereas justification is our title. Now, what is the importance of a title? If you have a car and want to get it registered, you have to have a title, right? You might have to get a duplicate title, right? See? <laughs> But you've got to have a title. That's our justification. In Pilgrim's Progress, it is that, that, uh, that, that thing that Christian held right next to his heart. Uh, our title for heaven. Sanctification is said to be our fitness as we become more and more like Jesus every day. And yet, realizing the frailty of our life, Right? Anybody here have an experience of seeing a cross word? It just comes out sometimes, doesn't it? Sometimes we've had it up to here, right? I've heard people say, I've had it up to here. Why does that come out? Because we still, we still have a bent toward evil. We still have sinful propensities. 
Thank God that that's not our, not our ticket to heaven, our title to heaven. The, the redeemed will live with the angels who have never fallen. But we still have the unconscious nature of sin with all of its sinful propensities, which are overcome day by day through temptation and trouble. We all have inherited cultivated tendencies to evil, which day by day hinder our growth. But these struggles make us stronger every day as we realize what's happened and we confess our sin and you know our sins are said to have that they need to go beforehand into judgment because of the judgment of the living coming up one day. It's a battle and a march. That struggle is a battle and a march. And it's described in Galatians chapter 5. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, 16 to 18. Galatians chapter 5, 16 to 18. Say amen if you have it. This I say then, walk in the what? Remember what the Spirit plants love in our hearts, right? Romans 5, 5. Walk in the Spirit. When you give your heart to Jesus, the Holy Spirit has been given permission to come into your heart, into your life, and put love in your, in your life. Actually, love is the fulfilling of the what? The law. So he says here, walk in the Spirit, that ye full, not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusted again. Now, what is flesh here? That refers to our sinful nature, right? In Paul, the word flesh often means our sinful nature, which is our propensity toward evil. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if ye be led by the, of the spirit, you are not under the law. That is to say, you are not under the condemnation of law. Right? Because he looks at you as though you never sinned. Really, justification is really a fancy word for forgiveness. It's used that way in the spirit of prophecy. All the while, there's no condemnation for the believer. Romans 8, 1 says, There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Let's read it from another, another verse. Uh, Romans chapter 4, verse 8. Romans chapter 4, verse 8. I just love this verse. Blessed is the man whom the Lord will not, what? Impute sin. That's the justified believer. That's the one whom God will not impute sin to. Another one, Psalms 32, verse 2. Psalms 32, verse 2. The psalmist understood this. Psalm 32, verse 2. There's so many chapters in Psalms, and some of them are short, short and some of them are long, and I have trouble estimating how many pages. Psalm 32, verse 2. Actually, the longest chapter in the Bible is in the Psalms, right? You know what Psalm it is? 119. Psalm 32, verse 2. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Okay. What could possibly keep true believers in Jesus from being saved? I use the word true believers. Ones who have given their hearts to Jesus and accept the righteousness of Christ as a justified believer. What could possibly keep them from, from, from being saved? Nothing. Nothing can separate us. The, that's the theme of Romans chapter 8, and especially the last verses. Nothing can separate us from him. God does not condemn the believer in Jesus because of imputed righteousness. I'm trying to say this as many ways as I can say it this morning. I'm trying... Because this is the center of God's will for us. This is where I want to be every day. Totally forgiven as in justification. And growing up into Christ every day like two oars of a boat. Justification and sanctification. Pulling together, right? So the boat goes, moves forward. It's like two sides of a coin. You know, if it doesn't have two sides, it's not a coin, right? On the one side of that coin is imputed righteousness. On the other side is imparted righteousness. On one side is the root of our salvation. 
The other is the fruit of our salvation. Uh, on one side is justification. On the other side is sanctification. Okay. You have to have both. You can't long remain a sanctified believer when you're ignoring Jesus and justification. On the other hand, you can't really have a sanctified life unless you are a justified believer. And I have to say this, we need justification at the end of the Christian pathway just as much as we need at the beginning. We're not on a ladder going this way. We are we already at the top of the ladder in justification. We're at the top of the ladder. You don't have to climb that ladder. On the other hand, we are growing every day under that great rainbow of promise called justification. <clears throat> it is good news. This is liberating news. The justified believer has access to the continued favor of God. Ephesians 2.6 says that we sit with him in heavenly places. Continued favor of God. Is that where you want to be every day? Beside Jesus in his throne. So where is Jesus? Let's, let's, let's not skip that verse. Ephesians 2, it's in our scripture reading this morning. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. Sometimes I try to cut things short in interest of time, but sometimes we don't, some things we don't want to miss. Ephesians 2, verse 6. If you have it, say amen. And hath, and hath, what is the tense in this verse? Past tense. We need to look at the tenses in the writings of Paul. And hath raised us up together. Do you believe that? This is unbelievable. Paul believed it. Let me ask you a question. Where did Paul get this from? He got this from Jesus. Where did Martin Luther get this from? He got it from Paul. And Paul got it from Jesus. And Paul says in Galatians 1 that he spent some time with Jesus out in the desert of Arabia, right? I don't know exactly how long he was there, but it was probably over three years. How long did he spend with the disciples? Three and a half years, right? Then Paul comes along, the great apostle to the Gentiles, and, and he, he is taught by Jesus personally for three years out in the wilderness of Arabia. You can read about that in Galatians 1. I don't know if Jesus came down bodily, talked to him, or whether it was through visions, but he was taught one-on-one. -on -one. That's where he got this. That's where Luther got it. Hebrews 8, verses 1 and 2. So we sit with him in heavenly places. How often? Every day and continually, right? So we sit with him in heavenly places. Him, where's Jesus? Um, Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. He's going to summarize now for us what he said in the first seven chapters. And I recommend this would be tremendous reading. Try to read this with understanding. Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched in, not man. So where's Jesus? Right where he went when he ascended to heaven after the cross, right? He's on the throne. And we sit with him in heavenly places, but he's also our what? Our high priest, he's our minister. One who ministers to our every need every day. He's also the source of our justification and our righteousness. By faith, we sit with our high priest in heavenly places. The Holy Spirit constantly causes us to look to Jesus. He's the great shower of Jesus. Uh, we won't take the time to turn to John 16, 13 to 15, but several times in those verses, John 16, 13 to 15, he says that the Holy Spirit shows us Jesus. Think we should be praying for the Holy Spirit? Oh, indeed we should. The Holy Spirit, pray for the Holy Spirit. If you want to know Jesus, pray for the Holy Spirit and open his word, right? For the purpose of knowing Jesus. 
He always points us to him as we meditate on God's word. So Jesus is in his sanctuary in heaven. The book of Hebrews is the message, that precious letter, that Jesus is our high priest in heavenly places. He wrote this to the Hebrew Christians. Their earthly sanctuary came to an end, didn't it? And many of them must have wondered, well, where's Jesus now? <clears throat> He's in this heavenly sanctuary. He works tirelessly for us. Hebrews, 8, not, Hebrews 9 verse 24 says he works for us. His work for, is for us. I think everything has stopped in the way of new creation and so forth. He's interested now in us, and he wants to make a new creation within us. He ever lives to make intercession for us, it says. This morning, I want to talk about justification by faith in the framework of the sanctuary. Now, the Jews, the ancient Hebrews, became Christians. Many of them became Christians in the first century. But they were the people of the sanctuary, weren't they? You think of the Old Testament. The Jews were the people of the sanctuary. Does God have a people of the sanctuary today? There are not very many people talk about the sanctuary except Adventists. I want to present this this morning as number one and number two. I'm going to, if I had this on the screen or screen here, I would say number one, Jesus in his sanctuary. In that heavenly temple as our minister. We could turn to Hebrews chapter seven. Number one, Jesus in his sanctuary. Hebrews chapter seven, 22 and 25. What is he doing there? Hebrews 7, 22 and 25. Twenty-two, by so much was Jesus made a surety for a better testament or a better covenant covenant. Jesus is our what? He's our surety. Verse 25. And there truly were many. Oh, wait a minute here, 25. Wherefore, he is able to save, unto, save them to the uttermost that come to God by him, seeing that he, what does it say next? Ever liveth to make intercession for us. So number one, Jesus in the sanctuary, that's the source of our justification. We have no justification apart from his ministry and, and what he's done for us. Number two, the Bible also talks in the New Testament about a soul temple. I want to just read um, a little bit from 1 Corinthians. You're all familiar with these verses, I think. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. It says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Now, what temple is that one? That's the soul temple, right? Corporately, it's the church. Temple on earth. There's a temple in heaven, and there's a temple on earth, right? Let's look at another one. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, and that ye have that ye have which ye have of God, and you're not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. What temple is that talking about? The temple on earth, right? It's talking about us, every believer. Let's look at another one. 2 Corinthians 6, 16. This comes up a number of different times in different ways. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16. It says, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols for what? You are the temple of the living God. And God hath said, I will dwell in them, walk in them, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Let's look at it in another verse. Ephesians chapter 2. 
Ephesians chapter 2, 19 to 22. Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. Say amen if you have it. Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. That wasn't very strong, so I'm going to wait a little bit. Verse 19. Therefore, now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but, what does it say? Fellow citizens. You know, the Spirit of Prophecy says the church on earth and the church in heaven are one. Fellow citizens with the saints in the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all of the building fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple of the Lord. What temple is that talking about? It's the old temple, right? It's talking about us. Corporately, it's the church. In whom ye also are built together for an habitation through the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to refer to that as number two. The soul temple over here, where the Holy Spirit works, where sanctification takes place every day, right? Where we become more and more like Jesus every day. That's number two. Number one is the sanctuary in heaven where Jesus is our high priest. Where justification comes from. The other and where sanctification takes place. <clears throat> our sanctification is inspired by number one, Jesus and his word. That's what it's inspired from. As the Holy Spirit ministers in the soul temple, number two. Do we get the picture? I'm trying to, I wish I had it on a, on a screen so I could illustrate it. Now both Paul in Hebrews and John in Revelation say that there is a temple in heaven, right? A number one. In Revelation 1, John, John starts right out. Revelation chapter 1. With a vision of Jesus walking among what? The golden candlesticks. Okay? And a little later in the chapter he says that the candlesticks represent what? The church. That's number two, right? Jesus in, his, in the heavenly temple walks among the candlesticks in number two on the earth, which represent the church on earth. What a close connection between heaven and earth, between number one and number two. The church on earth and the church in heaven are how many? One. It is to this huge temple in heaven, the dwelling place, that's number one, that huge temple in heaven, the dwelling place of 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands of angels. That's where they dwell. Number one, they are all circled around the throne, crying, holy, 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 right? There are special beings that are right around the throne. And these people know the holiness of God. They know about righteousness. And where our attention is drawn, remember the Holy Spirit points us to who? Jesus. Always points to Jesus as we, you know, we should never open the Bible without doing what first? Praying for the Holy Spirit to guide our minds and to make these words meaningful to us, to make Jesus meaningful to us. That's where Jesus is. Now notice the invitation that, we are, that we're given every day. Where do we worship God? Do we worship it here or do we worship him there? Let's look at it. Hebrews chapter 6, 19 and 20. Here's the invitation that we have every day. Hebrews chapter 6, 19 and 20. Hebrews 6, 19 and 20. Here's what it says. Which hope we have as an anchor to the soul. Where is our hope, by the way? You know, hope is not uh, something that we just hope is going to happen. Hope is a noun here. Hope is a person. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which entereth into within the veil, whither the forerunner is of us is entered, even Jesus as a high priest after the, after the order of Melchizedek. Where is our hope to be placed, our aspiration to be placed? In our hope, right? Which is Jesus. Now, if we turn to Hebrews chapter 10, same verses, 19 and 20. Hebrews 10, 19 and 20. This is the invitation. Having therefore, brethren, Boldness to do what? Enter into the holiest by the what? By the blood of Jesus. Is there blood in the most holy place? 
<laughs> if we go back a couple of verses in uh, chapter 9, verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by what? His own blood. He entered once into the holy place, having, etern having obtained eternal redemption for us. Where's the blood? Right now? It's in the most holy place, right? Where Jesus is. Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. His blood is efficacious for the first century and the third century and the 10th century and the 21st century, right? Verse 20, by a new and living way. First of all, let me read verse 19 again. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated, what does it say next? For us. All of this is for us. We need to take this personally. Through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. What an invitation. Our faith is directed to where our forerunner has entered. Into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Where is Jesus today? In the most holy place of heaven's sanctuary. We're living in the hour of God's judgment. Our message to the world is a judgment, our message, right? It's a day of atonement message. The Hebrew Christians were people of the sanctuary. And God has a people of the sanctuary today. In Malachi chapter 3, they're called the sons of Levi. And Malachi 3, 1 to 4 is a description of the judgment of the living, by the way. It's used that way in the spirit of prophecy. Malachi 3, 1. That he will suddenly come to his temple, come to your name in the judgment. And he'll purify the sons of Levi. Who do you think the sons of Levi are right now? They're the people of the sanctuary. Because they're the ones who dwell there by faith. The great lesson from the Hebrew tabernacle was the close relationship between God and his people. That's the lesson of the Jewish sanctuary. In Exodus 25, 22, it says, I will come and commune with you there, right? Fellowship with him in the Old Testament sanctuary. But now he's where? He's in heaven now. Number one. He's the source of our justification. I think uh, we should study the sanctuary in this message. <laughs> Daniel 11.31 calls it the sanctuary of strength. Daniel 11.31. We won't turn there. In the, in the um, original language, it's maos. I don't know if you can pronounce it that way or not. M-A-O-Z. Sanctuary of strength. That's what that word means. It means refuge, fortress, a place of strength. The sanctuary of strength is not the soul temple, number two. <laughs> That's not where the sanctuary of strength is. Our, our, our thoughts and our prayers are directed to what? Number one, where Jesus is. What happens in the soul temple is a result of something that happens in heaven, where he pours out his blessing, the blessing of justification over us so that he can work within us. Sanctuary of strength is not the sole temple on earth. It's not the church on earth. They got this wrong in the third century. A man by the name of Augustine made the church the center of, of attention. He, suffered, he, he confused the earthly sanctuary with the church. That's not the sanctuary of strength for us. We are feeble. We are subject to sin. We have the sinful nature. We have a lot of growing to do. The sanctuary of strength is number one, where Jesus is our high priest, where the angels dwell and are commissioned to earth every moment and every day for us. The sanctuary in heaven where Jesus is, that's where our faith is directed. The Bible says, put not your faith in what? Princes. Don't even put your faith in the one that you think is the most righteous on earth. I don't want anybody to put your faith in what I'm saying this morning. I want you, I, I would wish that you would go to the scriptures and say, is, these things are real true. I would suggest the reading of the first eight, eight chapters of, 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 uh, of Romans, the first eight chapters of Romans and, Rome, and Galatians chapter three. Make that your daily bread for a while. It's wonderful. The idea and message of Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary 
is what was taken away for 1260 years. In Romans, Daniel chapter 8, it says, by him the daily was taken away. That is the little horn. The daily was taken away? Christ's ministry in the sanctuary was taken away. And for 1260 years, people didn't know where Jesus was. An earthly priest and a priesthood and an earthly um, things were taking place in the church and, and, and their mind was directed to the church, the soul temple, and not to the tent sanctuary in heaven. That happened for 1260 years. Satan took that refuge away and the people didn't know where Jesus was and the vital work of Jesus for them in heaven was taken away. People forgot that number one, the sanctuary in heaven where Jesus is. In a future sermon, I want to address the fact that the little horn of Daniel 8 took away the daily, but now in our day, he wants to take away the yearly. When we say yearly, what do we mean? Christ's ministry in the most holy place. The yearly service was in the most holy place. He took away the daily. But in our day, he wants to take away the yearly. You know, there's nobody in the whole universe that wants to see this work finished more than Jesus. And he wants to come again. I heard somebody say that in the Sabbath school class this morning. He wants to come. Christ in the most holy place, his finishing work in the hour of God's judgment. If we forget Jesus and his work for us, we have no message for the world. We, wanna, we, we have a message for the world, right? I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. That's what it's about. Righteousness by faith is the gospel. Um, in the spirit of prophecy, he saw the third angel pointing to the most holy place. That's where we're directed. We have no message for the world apart from this. That's where our safety, our justification, our inspiration is, number one. The abomination of desolation, the Antichrist took Jesus away. They took his intercession away. They took away his priesthood and caused people to look to number two, the soul temple, the church on earth, for their acceptance. An earthly church, a counterfeit priesthood. This is really the only thing that sets us apart from all of the other churches, I tell you that. Today I'd like to invite you to a reconsecration to number one. to turn your eyes on Jesus, to look full in his wonderful face. Some of these things may be new to you. I've entitled this sermon, A New Thing, Number Two. <laughs> we talked about number one last time, a new thing. But I assure you, this is not new light. This is precious old light. It's in our book. And it's in our books, the red books. It's there. If you want to read about this in the Spirit of Prophecy, uh, First Select Messages is the book. It's the most accurate thing that we have about 1888. First Selected Messages. It's about to be hidden from our view if we're not careful. Satan's been very successful at this. People get out of touch with Jesus. We don't want to get out of touch with Jesus. I appreciate what Paul had to say this morning when he said, we need to turn our eyes upon Jesus. Don't let that slip. Begin, people get out of touch with Jesus and begin to trust in the church. Anything wrong in the church? <laughs> There's things wrong in the church, but I can't do anything about that. My faith is to be directed where? And the Lord will take care of the church. I don't need to even talk about it, do I? Begin to trust in the church. Begin to trust in personal behavior and performance and our own experience. And that results in one of two things. It either results in pride or discouragement. If we better begin to put our trust in number two and look to that totally and, and, and forget about number one, one of two things will happen. Either we'll become proud and boastful or we'll become discouraged. And the devil doesn't really care which one it is because they all both lead to the same problem. The devil doesn't care very much. Well, 
May your prayers ascend to the place where Jesus is. May your prayers be moistened with the incense of Christ's righteousness. As the Holy Spirit presents these prayers in heavenly places. It takes Christ's every moment work in heaven to accomplish this. He ever lives to make intercession for us. How often do you think we ought to spend with him? You think our experience should be a moment by moment experience also? I think so. Can we pray without ceasing? I think so. Now Daniel prayed three times a day, right? I don't, don't want to put that away. That's important. But we need to have a moment by moment connection with Jesus if we are to sit with him in heavenly places as we, go, as we see trouble coming upon the world. We need this more now than ever. His work in heaven for us, for us, is as important to us as was his death on the cross. Because that's where the blood is right now. That's where the blood is. I want to read two more texts. First one talks about the cross. That's the blood, right? 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18. One of my dear friends gave me a pen, and this text was written on the pen, on the outside of the pen. 1 Corinthians 1 18. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18. Let's take all the comfort we can out of this verse and the one that follows. Verse 18, it says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the, what is the word? It is a power. It is a power. The, and the blood is the power. And Hebrews 9, 12. And we've already talked about that one. About the blood as well. So there it is. 